Namaste, and welcome to the 35th episode of Uladu Narpadu. You know, this book is so foundational. It's so important because it gives the, the real standard of authentic non-duality, authentic Advaita. Huh? Don't fall for this new age, neo Adwaita <laughs> confirmed. <laughs> because it sells you duality as non-duality. And this verse actually points out exactly how that works. The mind having subsided, knowing and being the reality, which is always attained, is the true attainment, siddhi. All other siddhis are merely like powers acquired in a dream. If one wakes up from sleep, will they be real? Will those who have discarded the unreal state of self-forgetfulness by abiding in the real state of self-knowledge, be deluded by those unreal cities? Therefore, know and be as you, the reality, are. So this is the thing. This verse and the next verse talk about phony non-duality versus real non-duality. And this is a theme that comes up again and again in Uladu Narpadu, because it's a very common error. Merely to think I am that is different from actually being that. Huh? If you are actually the self, you're not thinking in terms of attaining anything, because you're already being that. So there's no difference between I and that. I am that. Not that I have to become that, or that I even have to state the uh, relationship that I am that. No, I just am. It's, it doesn't have to be stated or thought. You see, that's the difference between thinking aboutness and being. Uh, when, when someone is thinking about, it's always in terms of words, concepts, some artificial thing, some conceit, oh, I am that. Well, good for you, buddy. <laughs> that may be actually the penultimate stage before actual enlightenment, when it's real. When it's an affectation, of course, it's completely bogus. What's the difference? <laughs> One who really has attained doesn't feel the need to claim it, doesn't, doesn't ride on a high horse of, I am that, buddy. You know, just like the other day we were watching a video, Skanda recommended, and we found that here's a guy who is teaching, trying to uh, express the non-dual point of view. And he's being interviewed by this other guy, and the interviewer just doesn't get it. You know, he can't, <laughs> he can't get it. What? You mean there's no objective reality? There's only the self? I don't get it. He admits it. But the, the guy who's being interviewed, instead of humbly getting down off his high horse <laughs> and say, well, okay, if you don't get it, then you need to begin at a lower stage. And then questioning him to, you know, having a back and forth dialogue to find out where is he really at? What does he perceive as real? And starting from there. Now, if you read the talks 
Ramana always would meet people halfway. If someone could not cognize the highest truth, he was willing to come down to find out what they could understand and then begin from there to go higher. See, that's a real master. You know, Osho, the reason I broke off with Osho was because I found out he has a very low opinion of Ramana as a master. He doesn't get it. Or he's trying to hide something. I think he was afraid that if people really understood, if his disciples specifically really understood what a great master Ramana is, that they would leave him and go to Ramana <laughs> like I did. <laughs> because Osho, there's one thing about him, he never explains actually how things work. I noticed this very, very uh, clearly when I was working on the Secret of the Golden Flower series. Because in Osho's uh, presentation of the Secret of the Golden Flower, he never really explains what goes on under the hood. He presents it, you know, in a very polished way, a very intellectual way. Um, and it seems like really good, right? But if you actually sit down and try to practice it, it's like, how do you do this? <laughs> so in my presentation, I tried to give many examples from my own experience. That this is how it came up, this is how it looked to me, and this is how I did it. And actually you can reverse the flow in any of the chakras, uh, not only the Agnya chakra, but of course, reversing the flow in the Agnya Chakra leads immediately, almost immediately anyway, to real ecstasy. So that's the normal way to practice it. But anyway, getting back to the subject, that Ramana always goes into the mechanism under the hood, how things really work. And in this verse, he's talking about siddhis. And he's saying the ultimate siddhi of realizing the self is already attained. And, and he used to tease people who came to him and were being, <laughs> being obtuse. <laughs> he said, do you exist? <laughs> and of course they say yes. And then he says, ah, so you do recognize that you are the self. Because... What else is there, really? What else could you be? Huh? If you identify as the mind, if you identify as your feelings, if you identify as sensations, or as the body, or as, even worse, your name, <laughs> your position in some social structure, huh? your, your function in some uh, business or corporation, or your uh, social standing, huh? like I'm the husband of so-and-so, or I'm the wife of so-and-so. These are all artificial. These are all conceits. And they're causes of suffering because they're temporary. See? So what happens when we uh, think we're something that we're not? is that we're inevitably disappointed. And this is why striving for these siddhis, huh? there, there are ashta siddhis, eight siddhis, uh, lagima, mahima, prapti, and so on, becoming greater than the greatest, smaller than the smallest, uh, able to see and hear things far away, able to actually take something from a remote location and bring it like that. And, and of course, these are great powers that can be used not only for good, but for evil. Not only for unselfish purposes, but for very selfish purposes as well. And this is what always happens. People who get cities, if they even can get them, because they're very difficult to obtain, but once got 
most people will misuse them for their own selfish purposes. And of course, that always leads to fall down. Uh, why? Because doing anything <laughs> for selfish gain creates karma. And because of the karma, then you have to fall down, take birth again, go through the whole nonsense suffering of childhood and relationships and marriage and children and work. And ah, you really want to do that? I don't. I want to get out of here. <laughs> Let me out of here. So what that means is no more selfish actions. Really, that's the standard of karma yoga. In karma yoga, one does not act anymore for one's own pleasure or one's own benefit, but one's actions are calculated to benefit as many people as possible. Ultimately, I mean, the greatest benefit you can do is to realize the self. Why is that? Because every person who becomes enlightened increases the vibration of the whole universe. The whole world, the whole universe becomes a better place with each person who becomes enlightened. So the greatest cause, the greatest mission, uh, the greatest help that one can be to others is to help them realize the self. That's the real Siddhi. That's the real power, the greatest mystic power of all. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create conditions where people can actually realize the self. But what we find is most of them, in fact, all of them that we have encountered so far, cannot give up selfish action. They cannot give up kamya karma, acting out of self-interest, or to, to put it plainly, lust. And because of this, they can never really get to bhakti, because their bhakti is always going to be tinged with selfish interest. You know, what can I get out of loving God? Maybe he'll give me some special powers. Yeah. Huh? Twirl the mustache. So that's not real bhakti. Real bhakti means I love God just for the beauty of it. Huh? Because it's beautiful. That's all. And is more beautiful than any other form of love. Because every other form of love is local or extended selfishness. I love my body. I love my family. I love my country. I love my religion. I love my culture. I love the planet. Huh? Whatever. These are all extended selfishness. And of course, I love myself. I love my body. This is local selfishness. <laughs> this is really, really low. So if you have these aspects in your personality, then you have to find a way to overcome them. And of course, the only way really to overcome them is to practice unselfishness, which means giving. That's why we have always given our materials for free. We have never sold books or videos or CDs or anything like that. That means we are not benefiting from this work. Huh? The whole world can benefit from it. But if there's any benefit for us, it's that we get to engage in karma yoga and clear our path for higher stages of self-realization. So this is what everyone should do. These books by Ramana Maharshi are available online for free. Uladu Narpadu, Upadesha Undiyar, huh? and so many others. And we'll be going into them gradually one by one. So please read them, study them, meditate on them, and realize them. And that will be the greatest benefit for the whole world. Om Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.